Coming up on this week's edition of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. From restaurant chain claims to political speeches, sustainability continues to be a hot topic in a number of circles. We've got a panel of experts who will share their thoughts on this important topic and how this issue may shape the future of both beef production and consumption. And now, NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. Hello and welcome to NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. I'm Kevin Oxer, coming to you from our home ranch here in Kersey, Colorado. Even as the COVID-19 situation continues to challenge our industry, one thing has been perfectly clear. American consumers love beef. It's been sobering to witness some of the supply chain disruptions that we've been seeing, including empty store shelves in some cases, where beef used to be. As cow-calf producers, stockers, and feedlot operators, we all depend on a fully functioning supply chain, including a consumer at the end of that chain who is willing to exchange their hard-earned dollars for our beef. Undoubtedly, the COVID-19 experience will change consumers' values and buying behaviors. But I suspect that many of the same issues that were important to consumers prior to COVID-19 will continue to be priority issues to consumers in a post-COVID-19 world. In February, we had an opportunity to sit down with a group of experts and discuss the topic of sustainability. And today, we're bringing you that panel discussion. Following the panel discussion, we'll hear an update from one of the panelists about COVID-19 and its impact on the sustainability issue. Now, let's take a look at our panel discussion. For years, America's beef producers have been leaders in the area of sustainability. After all, responsible land and natural resource stewardship go hand in hand with successful long-term cattle businesses. So why have cattle and cattle producers become targeted as public enemy number one when it comes to environmental sustainability and climate change. We're joined by a great panel of experts who will share their thoughts on this timely topic and give us some insight on how this issue will impact the future of the beef industry. Our first guest is Colin Woodall. He is the CEO of the National Cattlemen's Beef Association and before that, spent a decade as NCBA's chief lobbyist in Washington, D.C. Our next guest is Bob McCann of McFadden Ranch in Texas. Bob is past president of NCBA and is currently the president of the Global Roundtable for Sustainable Beef. We're also pleased to have Dr. Sarah Place with us, who spent years researching sustainability and currently works as the technical consultant at Alanco. And our final panelist is Dr. Wayne Morgan. He serves as the Corporate Vice President and President of Protein Products and Sustainability for Golden States Foods, and is also the Chairman of the U.S. Roundtable for Sustainable Beef. Well, let's get started with our discussion, and I guess I'd like to begin with setting the stage relative to definitions. Sustainability seems to be defined in a number of different ways by a number of different people. Um, Dr. Place, what would you, or how would you define sustainability? Yes, yeah, so really there is some broad agreement about the big picture of what sustainability means, right? First, that it's about economic viability, right? Environmental stewardship, uh, and social responsibility. All three of those things combined. Mm -hmm. And then it's about a long-term perspective, right? Um, so there is a lot of agreement there. And hopefully, as, as uh, viewers are thinking about that, re econ economic viability is number one, right? You have to be profitable to be sustainable. Mm -hmm. That is very key. But there are these other aspects of it, too. Um, and some of the, the controversy, if you will, or right. some of the disagreements about sustainability is how we rank some of the issues under each one of those umbrellas, if you will. Um, and that's, that's where um, different groups' efforts to actually get everybody in the room, all the interested parties, and come up with a, a firm uh, grasp of what we're all going to agree on that sustainability is about is so important. Well, Kevin, sustainability really speaks to the core of our businesses as, as uh, cattle producers. And you know, although it's somewhat of an unfamiliar term to a lot of producers, uh, it, it's been something that we've always done and always cared about. 
uh, the, the three components that Sarah spoke to, in environmental and economic and, and uh, uh, responsible for your communities are, sure. are things that cattlemen have always done. Right. So I kind of look at sustainability as, as just a, a term that we're able to use as a vehicle to kind of bring our consumers and our producers together because uh, it speaks to, to things that, that we're all concerned about and we, we can share those values. What do you say to people who say, you know, we've seen a lot of fads come and go. There was the lean meat fad and, um, you know, will, is this a fad that's going to be gone if we simply ignore it, Colin? No, it's not going away. And what's interesting is when you're out there talking to a lot of cattle producers and you bring up the term sustainability, you get a lot of eye rolls. Mm -hmm. And as Bob said, it's not about putting another level of burden on cattle producers. It's about taking the great work that they're already doing and showcasing it and putting some metrics behind it. Because when you look at the consumer, when you look at Congress, when you look at the regulators, when you look at the international uh, consumer, and also when you look at Hollywood these days, oh. the pressure is there. That's not going away. Okay. It is here to stay. So we could put our head in the, stand, in the sand and say, well, we're just gonna let sustainability uh, move on. Well, we'll be left behind. <laughs> and as J.D. Alexander, a former NCBA president once said, if you're not at the table, you're going to be on the menu. And so that's why we're at the table in this discussion of sustainability. That's a great way to, way to put it. And so, so you mentioned some of those special interest groups. It's amazing um, how many people are weighing in on this topic. I guess, Wayne, you spend a lot of time with consumers. I'm curious, are consumers also making decisions based on sustainability? Yeah. Well, our customers tell us that, yes, they are, uh, that, that they're being asked questions, uh, you know, what are we doing for the environment, um, how, are, how are we producing our products, what are the things that we are doing that makes a difference in the world that they live in. And if their customers are asking those questions, those customers are our customers. Uh, we're all in this industry together, we're tied together from the beef producer to the feed yard to the packer to the processor to the retailer, all the way to the consumer. And if those consumers have those questions, then they're questions that we need to face also. Yeah. And, and so when they have those questions, you know, I guess the question becomes, how do we even begin measuring it? Uh, you know, are you more sustainable than you and, and how do I know? I mean, you spent uh, a lot of time researching this, Dr. Place. What, what metrics are put in place to even begin measuring this concept? Yes, and so to even kind of address like the way you're framing that question, right, I think that's important for producers to understand that it's not necessarily about comparing yourself to another producer or whatever it may be, right? It's, it's about thinking about how all those resources fit within your own operation okay. and how you improve yourself, sure. right? And that's, that's very important uh, about this whole topic. And so we do have tools to look at that, right? We can we can use some of the, the tools in science to look at the whole supply chain and identify areas where, you know, more of the quote unquote impacts are taking place or more of the benefits from a sustainability perspective are taking place. So for example, that's that's really where our, our ranches, our cattle producers shine, right? Because mm -hmm. they bring a lot of value to the table, a lot of societal value that sure. at times they, they don't get paid for, right? In terms sure. of managing the landscape. Um, providing services with, with cattle that are a little bit beyond food, right? From wildfire suppression in terms of grazing to whatever those things may be. So we can use scientific tools to look at the whole supply chain, things like what are called life cycle assessment yep. to actually document that and track progress over time. And that's, that's really key to this conveying that message to the consumer is having not just the story, which is really compelling and the imagery, um, but also the numbers to back it up to. I'm really glad to hear you say that because I'm fearful that in some cases people have tried to pit one production system against the other and say grass fed is better this way or grain fed is better this way or cattle are more sustainable in this part of the country or that part of the country. Is that right? Yes, yes. And I think that's that's really key is, as, as we know, right, uh, the United States is just so diverse, mm -hmm. right, in terms of the, the landscapes, the natural resources that we have available. And so what makes the most sense in one area is going to be very different in another, right? Even as we sit here in Texas, the diversity is huge, yeah. right, in terms of what management systems work best. So I think that is what's key is for folks to, to understand that it's not about about comparisons like that, right? It is about your own operations. And I think, again, when, when folks think about that or hear that, right, they're already doing that, right? They're already probably setting goals for their own business and saying, how can I get better? Yeah. Kevin? Yeah. I'd just add that, you know, um, at the U.S. Roundtable for Sustainable Beef, we've taken a multi-stakeholder collaborative approach to try to get input from all the stakeholders, from all the constituency groups yes. across the in industry 
but we've given the lead, we've given the reins to the individual stakeholders of each constituency group to develop metrics around a common set of indicators so that we can be working towards these common indicators. But that constituency group, and in, in the case of beef producers, the beef producers are making the decisions as to which metrics are important and which ones we should be focused on. That's really encouraging. Yeah, that's right. It's, it's, it's really a collaborative uh, effort you know amongst all the all the stakeholders within the beef uh, beef link and and uh, within the round table and so you know I see it as uh, producers you know are usually always in a state of continuous improvement or want to be right. because they're they want to optimize their production on their on their land and they want to optimize their livestock production and so it it speaks to a lot of the things that the consumers are are concerned about as well. So. That's encouraging. So what's one thing you want producers to know about this? Colin, uh, what would be a message that you would have for producers relative to sustainability? You don't have to be scared of the term. I think that's something that a lot of producers are looking at that wondering, what am I going to have to do differently? Yeah. It's not about what you're going to have to do differently. It's about how we just better communicate that to all the stakeholders. And when we talk about the other stakeholders who are part of these roundtables, it's important to know that not all of them are necessarily stakeholders that most cattle producers would uh, want to share a table with, but they are a part of the discussion. Right. So we had to make a choice. Are we going to stiff arm them and just say we don't want to talk to them, or do we want to be a part of that conversation? One of those groups is the World Wildlife Fund. There's a lot of producers out there, a lot of viewers right now that wonder why in the world we're sitting at the table with the World Wildlife Fund given their track record. But what we have seen is by being at the table, having a conversation with them, yeah. educating them, we have seen a shift in their mindset. Sure. And now they're writing articles about the value of grazing. That's something that would not have happened if NCBA was not at the table in this process. That's a great point. I've seen, I've seen at those meetings um, the reluctance of, of people to be accepting of, uh, of ideas that they haven't heard or people that they don't trust. Um, and we've been working on this roundtable for five years. And the people that have been in the room, I think they have a respect and a trust for those uh, WWF members that are on our team and they are a part of our roundtable uh, that, that didn't exist before. And the, the, those members are, are collaborators and they bring things to the table that uh, sometimes we haven't thought of, of before and give us new ammunition to help tell our story. So I think they've been a vital part of this um, roundtable, um, even uh, beyond just the, the namesake, because uh, I'll be the first to admit early on, um, I was reluctant, but I thought, well, you know, you want to have their name. But, <laughs> but come to find out, they are really great contributors. They brought a lot of great things to the table for us. I heard once that uh, a discussion is when you get together to figure out what's right, and an argument is when you get together to figure out who's right. And I think as long as we're having discussions, uh, that's pretty important. We'll dig deeper into the issue of sustainability with our panel of experts right after this. Thank you to the men and women who continue to provide a safe, wholesome food supply through this pandemic. Beringer Ingelheim is proud to work alongside those committed to putting cattle first. Learn more at BICattleFirst.com. Case IH sales event is going on now, making it a great time to get the equipment you need at a price you can afford. You'll find new Farmall, Maxim, and Puma Series tractors, along with our complete line of hay tools, all at a special rate. But hurry, the sales event ends July 31st. All across the nation, ranchers are feeling the effects of immune system challenges in more than one in five of their weaned calves. It's a frustrating, costly journey. But help is on the way. Purina Starter Feeds, 
Now with RX3 immune support technology, it boosts calves' natural defenses, priming their immune systems from the start. Join the fight and talk to your Purina rep to learn more. Today, we're spending our time digging into the topic of sustainability and examining what it means for you as a beef producer, both now and in the future. Of course, beef sustainability begins on the farm or ranch, so we ask a few beef producers to share their perspective on sustainability. I think it's the whole package. You know, we take care of our land so that it takes care of our cattle. So sustainability is all the way from, from raising the calf right on up to where we're now uh, selling that beef at, you know, with the least amount of, uh, of byproducts or, or medicines that we can put into it. And I think that's where, uh, like I said, it's a whole package. Beef sustainability um, means providing the most efficient ways for my cattle to grow and to eat, um, to give them enough land um, to perform at their best with um, the right amount of resources necessary. Being at the table with all the, the partners that are involved, the consumers, producers, uh, and being aware of how, what people think about, about agriculture and livestock production, but that is a, that's a challenging question. And we're back with our discussion on the timely topic of sustainability. And folks, I want to begin with a, kind of an economic discussion. Does sustainability just add cost to the system in terms of changing practices and documenting? Or, or is there an opportunity to actually improve your profitability as well, Bob? Well, when you look at the basic components of sustainability, uh, environmental soundness, economic stability, and, and social responsibility, these are all things that uh, producers today uh, are, are paying attention to and those best management practices that they adopt or, or new practices and innovative practices that they adopt uh, I think all speak to, to being able to optimize their production on their property whether it's uh, good grazing systems that sure. you know that lend itself to a better water resources uh, or whether it's you know higher uh, weaning weights or better consumption rates with your herd uh, that are actually going to put more dollars in your pocket. So I think it, it's, uh, it's a positive influence on, uh, on operators, on ranchers, and, and uh, you know, it's, it's definitely, if you're able to kind of check those boxes uh, as you go and kind of try to be in a good state of continuous improvement on your operation, uh, it's it's going to make you more profitable and it's going to make you more sustainable. So. And that's that's what intrigues me and, and Dr. Place, you've done a lot of the research around that. It seems to me like some of the very issues, for instance, conception rate. I mean, conception rate's good for everybody, but one of the great things we can do to reduce greenhouse gas is have more calves born, right, by our cow herd. So some of those things are go hand in hand, would you agree? Yes, absolutely. So there's, there's lots of examples of essentially win-wins there, right, yeah. where what makes sense from an animal husbandry and animal management perspective right directly impacts you know your sustainability. Yeah, exactly your environmental sustainability so I think that is a, a key thing that, that Bob brought up of yeah it, it should not be antithetical to your profitability right it should be going hand in hand so speaking of that you know lots of people looking for opportunities to add value to their their operations and their calves and find ways to get premiums I guess Wayne from a downstream perspective do you anticipate a time when producers may get more money for implementing some of these practices or, or being in some way, shape or form defined as more sustainable? Yeah, like a lot of new initiatives and changes, um, um, it, it, there will probably be a case where early adopters are able to get a premium. There'll be programs in which they're able to identify themselves and differentiate themselves and they may command a premium. But over time, these, say, these practices become the norm and they just become what's expected. Baseline standards. Baseline standards. And so um, a lot of the things that we're talking about do though just make common sense. And they're, they're, the, the profit that's gonna be made or gained is gonna be back at, their, at, at your own level where you see um, increased performance. Sustainability is important in our business as well. And we, no one's offering us a premium to do the right thing. They expect us to do the right thing. They expect us to save energy, to, to reduce our water consumption, to reduce waste. Those are just greens fees. And, and they're good business practices. In the end, they may make us more successful. 
That's a good point. You know, we've spent a lot of time on this show talking about uh, the fact that we are in a global industry, uh, facing global competitors. And I'm curious, Sarah, Sarah um, what are other people around the world doing relative to this term of sustainability? Yeah, so I think um, just speaking to the science of it and thinking about you know some of these, these metrics of sustainability, if you will, um, other countries are making progress, but I think that's important for, for viewers to understand is that the United States really does <laughs> have one of the most environmentally efficient mm. beef production systems in, in the, the world, world right? Um, and a lot of it comes back to what we were just talking about, right? There's been a, a focus and a dedication to translating science to the ranch, to the feed yard, mm -hmm. to the whole parts, all the parts of the supply chain, um, and driving that progress, right? So from that perspective, uh, not to, to put down other countries, right? There's been a lot sure. of progress around the world and other efforts that uh, the other panelists will talk about, but we have really excelled in that area That's almost unintentionally right from from that standpoint in the united states colin you're involved in several international efforts is that correct you know because this is a global conversation ncba is not the only producer group that feels the pressure sure. to be engaged in this conversation ncba is a part of the international beef alliance International Beef Alliance is made up of the producer groups in Canada, Mexico, NCBA, Brazil, Paraguay, mm. Australia, and New Zealand. Mm. And while we are competitors in the marketplace, and also when you look at the metrics, we're competing on sure. how we produce and how that compares, we're still working together in the global sphere to make sure that collectively as a livestock cattle industry, we're getting those facts out there. And yeah, there are differences, absolutely. We're gonna be pointing out the differences across the board, but but ultimately it, it's incumbent upon all of us to sell this story because if beef production is being criticized in Brazil, that spills over in the United States yeah. and we need to make everybody better. Colin, I think that's a good point about the competitive nature of our business. Um, if you compare this to like the food safety issues, uh, there was a time where food safety was a competitive topic. Everybody tried to make their product safer and tried to use that as a leverage point to sell their product. But as an industry, we realized that this is a non-competitive issue. All boats rise when we have a safe, wholesome product and all boats sink. I think that we are getting closer to the point that people realize sustainability is very similar, uh, that we can all benefit from the industry moving up. We all know, and we've been in restaurants here in the United States where people are uh, trying to advertise and promote uh, sustainability claims for different food items. I'm curious, from an international perspective, how does sustainability drive uh, international demand for beef? Well, our consumers, I think, domestically and internationally, Kevin, uh, you know, in general, consumers, they like beef, and they, and they want to be able to trust their production practices and uh, that, are, that are being used uh, down the farm and, and throughout the whole beef chain. And so uh, if our consumers don't have a, don't have a real comfort level with how our, their product, our product is being sure. produced, then it's going to hurt our demand. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we need to, I think, do all we can to make sure that those people are, are educated and get all the information that, uh, that we're able to give them. And because uh, it's, it's kind of a shared value. They, they want to be able to trust our production practices and we, we need to be able to give them, ed educate them on that. So. Yeah. And I want to spend some time uh, gathering maybe some talking points in a few moments about what we can say to consumers about this. But still to come on Cattlemen to Cattlemen, we'll talk about the perception consumers have of the beef industry and why it's important for producers to engage in conversations about sustainability. We'll have more right after this. Case IH is proud to grow the century-long Farmall legacy by introducing the Farmall Utility 75A tractor. More comes standard on this economy-level tractor, giving you the features and performance you need without the additional costs. FPT patented engine and emission solutions require no regeneration so you can keep your tractor running longer. The Farmall Utility 75A is engineered with heavier components built into the tractor. This evenly distributes weight in all the right places without the addition of wheel weights. 
The optional power shuttle transmission makes the Farmall Utility 75A easy to operate, especially during loader work. By simply pulling the shuttle lever up or down, you can move forward or reverse without pushing in the clutch to shift gears. All Farmall Utility 75A tractors come with spacious, comfortable cab and non-cab operating stations that offer exceptional visibility with easy access to all your controls. A high visibility roof panel comes standard making loader work like stacking bales much easier. Experience the difference. Test drive a Farmall Utility 75A today. Contact your Case IH dealer or visit caseih.com forward slash minute. Stressors that trigger bovine respiratory disease are all around. So when you spot BRD in your herd, turn to Suprevo, the fast that lasts. Suprevo is rapidly absorbed in as little as 45 minutes and lasts up to 28 days. Because in the race against BRD, you need to win. Ready, set, Suprevo. In case of human injection, seek immediate medical advice for use in beef and non-lactating dairy cattle only. For prescribing information, talk to your veterinarian or visit Suprevo.com. Welcome back to this special edition of Cattlemen to Cattlemen. As we talk with a group of experts about the topic of beef industry sustainability. You know, we were just talking before break about perceptions people have of our industry and our product. And Wayne, uh, I'm curious again from downstream, what are the perceptions of beef industry sustainability from folks outside our industry? I think that the perceptions most people have um, are drawn upon from just um, ignorance of what happens. We've got a disconnection between uh, what we do and what is done in, in not just sustainability, probably all areas of, of beef production and what actually happens. Um, people have this perception that uh, farms are controlled by big corporations and that it's all just a big business. It's some kind of machine out there that's generating these food products that they get on, the, on their table every day. Uh, they, they don't have an appreciation for these are individual men and women that get up every morning and do a job to bring this product to, to the table. Um, so to me, the biggest perception uh, that, that we deal with is this, um, this idea that there's, there's a, a corporate machine out there manufacturing product and that they don't care about anything except for a profit. Gotcha. And even though nothing could be farther from the f truth, I think that's where most people's heads immediately go when they talk about um, in our livestock industry in general. Dr. Place, you've been interviewed a number of times. You've been on TV shows and talk shows. I mean, what are some of the misperceptions you've heard? Yeah, so I think to Wayne's point, actually a lot of it comes back to just the basics of how cattle are raised mm -hmm. and the idea that cattle are housed in these extreme conditions. So, okay. you know, for example, we've We've had tours with folks that are not just consumers, but they are uh, buyers for sure. universities, for hospitals, uh, taking them out to a university feed yard and seeing the conditions of, you know, cattle are in a pen and they're free to roam around and consume feed when they want. And uh, a comment was made, well, I expected that they were all going to be in cages. Wow. Right. So um, some of those very basic things are where a lot of this sustainability misperception can fester. Sure. And that's why I think people can latch on to ideas like that cattle are producing more greenhouse gas emissions than cars, right? Because they're already so uh, divorced from reality in terms of how things are being produced, right. if that makes sense. Um, so I think what we see over and over again, even though sustainability is bigger than the environment, a lot of these misperceptions come down to environmental impact at the end of the day, and a lot of it about climate change, really. What have you heard over time, Colin? You know, it's interesting when you look at the misperceptions and how they have found their way into so many issues that are having an impact on our industry right now. Dr. Place just said this is bigger than just the environment mm -hmm. and we're seeing that in things such as the dietary guidelines and the right. discussion on the formulation of the 2020 dietary guidelines. We have seen this in introduction of the Green New Deal on Capitol Hill and the fact that it really received a lot of support from constituents and individuals who just don't know the facts exactly. of what's going on and it has really played a big hand in our continued battle against fake meat. Right because one of the things that we see both from the consumer that is buying this product and also the companies that are manufacturing this product is they use these misperceptions to their advantage to try to market their product over our product. 
Well, this creation of a feeling of guilt really bothers me. You know, you got to feel guilty about eating beef because what it's doing to the environment. And I'm curious, what are we doing to correct that misperception and to lift that guilty feeling that's saying you can have what you love to eat, Bob, a great piece of beef, and feel comfortable that you're not contributing to global warming? Yes, so I think a lot of it, a lot of the conversation has shifted over time as we've seen more engagement from folks in the beef industry, right? So I think that's a positive is whether it's through roundtables, through the efforts of NCBA, through the beef checkoff, right? These things do change when you actually engage with the conversation. Um, so in terms of, it, of addressing that, I think that those entities are part of that. And honestly, even just producers engaging, right? It, it can be as simple as engaging at the local level, because sure. I think probably a lot of viewers have that, that experience where even in rural communities, right, you, you hear some of these things about uh, misperceptions or documentaries being shown in schools that have a lot of misinformation about animal agriculture in there, right? So um, I think that's the key thing that's been brought up earlier is that first and foremost, we got to be there and it does make a difference when you're there in terms of having that conversation and bringing the facts to the table and being being respectful about it right because to your point about guilt um, we got to think about the psychology of this right like people are um, making these decisions because they feel like they want to do something good and we have to give people the alternative which is you did do something good when you bought beef right you right. supported wildlife habitat you did good by supporting rural communities um, you, you did good by climate change, right? I mean, that, that's what we have to connect those dots for people, that it's not just we're less bad, it's that we are a positive contributor to the world. That's great to hear, because I know in our rural community, my kids were asked to read an article in health class, junior high health class, that was based on, could this be your future dinner? And it was a plate of uh, insects, talking about the value of insect protein and, and what they're doing for climate when they uh, eat that or choose something like that rather than beef. And this is in rural America, Kersey, Colorado. So it's all over. Speaking of which, let's talk about uh, the elephant in the room, so to speak. You mentioned it before, Bob, and that's uh, greenhouse gas. The fact of the matter is, we do have ruminant animals, and right. they do produce greenhouse gas. Talk to us about what we need to know relative to that. Well, I think it's important, and we're starting to have that conversa conversation uh, about cattle producers are, are actually uh, not not part of the problem, but part of the solution. Okay. And uh, you know, cattle harvest a lot of plant materials that are that are inedible by humans, and convert it into this wonderful nutrient dense. Uh, product, you know, that uh, as beef and that's that's healthy and good for you, and in that process, you know, there's uh, there's some conversions going on that uh, the scientists like Dr. Place could speak <laughs> to better than me, but there's some conversions going on that they're actually taking, you know, carbon out of the atmosphere and putting it into a carbon sink. There's things like regenerative grazing that there's a lot of research going on right now about okay. and uh, carbon sequestration. And, uh, and, and that's part of why at the round tables, we, uh, we like to incorporate a lot of the researchers, a lot of the universities, yes. and, uh, and the NGOs also have, have deep interest in this and, and have been very, very helpful, a lot of them have. And so it's, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of a basic tenet that, uh, you know, cattle producers are, uh, we're part of the solution mm -hmm. and we, we want our consumers to, to know that. And I think the more they get that information, the better they feel about their consuming that product. So why should beef producers engage in conversations, social media, one-on-one -on -one and otherwise, about sustainability? Wayne, what would you say? So uh, we look at things from uh, the po point of view that the consumers are right. Yep. Whether, whether they're exactly right or, or not, they're still right. And we feel like um, we, we need to go with a one-two punch. Yep. One, show them that we care. Show them that these topics are also mean something to us and that they are important, but two, come behind it with the facts. Come, come back with the science and the data to support the, the facts that, that we are a part of the solution. What are a couple of key talking points that we as producers should should have on the tip of our tongue, Sarah? Yeah, so despite what I just said about the, the greenhouse gas emissions, even when we look at the, the old way of accounting for methane, okay. right, direct emissions from cattle and their manure are 2% of U.S. greenhouse gas emissions according to the EPA. Yeah. And that's that's one of those according things. According to the EPA, not yes, according to the NCBA, no, exactly. according to the EPA. Yes, yes. and that's, that's what's really key. So this, this whole uh, idea that we're going to eat our way out of climate change, that you know, depriving yourself of nutritious and delicious beef is gonna make a difference is, is really kind of fantasy, right? So 
Um, I think that's one of those key things to remember. And then was brought up, you know, the, the power of the ruminant is really key. I think we need to talk about what we bring to the table as beef mm -hmm. and talk about that upcycling story, right, of what cattle do is convert things of little or no value to higher value products, right? We know that if we look at the feed conversion of on a protein basis, cattle generate two and a half times more high quality protein for the world, for our food supply than exists without them. Right, and I think that's important for people to, to communicate that story too. That's, that's great news. And you know, Kevin, there's a lot of people out there that believe that if we remove cattle from the land, that we can use that land to grow other things. Right. And I'm here to tell you, we're not gonna grow broccoli in central Nevada. It's just not gonna happen, but we can grow forage. And as Dr. Place just said, we have an animal that can convert that forage, which is of no use to us as humans, and turn it into high quality protein. So that is why we have such a, a great story to tell. And back to Wayne's point, we have to tell that story because if there's a void out there, there's plenty of people that are willing to fill that void. Beyond Burger, Impossible Burger, they would love to fill that void for us. So if we're not tooting our own horn, then these facts are never gonna get out. And we need to make sure that we continue to get that out, social media, cattlemen to cattlemen, all our opportunities to share it, not only with producers, but especially with consumers. We are the original plant-based protein. Would you agree? <laughs> yes. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> Still to come on Cattlemen to Cattlemen, we'll dig deeper into the issue of sustainability with our panel of experts. Stay with us. In the world of cattle vaccines, when you see fewer reactions, you'll notice healthier cattle and higher profits too. Because sometimes good protection is about what you don't see. Protect your productivity with cattle vaccines from Merck Animal Health. Proven to cause fewer reactions. You'll like what you see. Our trusted portfolio is just one more way Merck Animal Health works for you. Talk to your veterinarian and visit CattleFriendlyVaccines.com to learn more. We didn't just design the 6M tractors with you in mind. We designed them with you by our side. The new 6M tractors from John Deere. Reimagined by you, for you. With improved visibility, better maneuverability, and more ways to customize, so you get everything you need and nothing you don't. Experience the new 6M at your local John Deere dealer. Weeds will rob me of my investments. The weeds are not palatable to cows. They will not eat them, or if they do eat them, they, some of them may be toxic. So there's a return on investment by allowing there to be more grass available to be grazed by the cattle. Welcome back to Cattlemen to Cattlemen, where today we're highlighting the issue of sustainability and what it means for beef producers. Well, I'd like to just conclude the show by asking each of you to share just some th final thoughts about what you'd like our viewers to know. Colin? Sustainability is not the boogeyman that a lot of people think that it is. Okay. We need to look at this as an opportunity to get ahead of this discussion. Let's not look at this as an attack on what we're doing, but as a way to sell what we're doing. Excellent. Wayne, what would you add? We're all in it together. Uh, this is a beef supply chain. It starts with the producer, but it ends up with a consumer and all of us along the way have a common goal that we want to deliver a wholesome, safe and product that our customers can believe in and feel good about consuming. And so um, my company, we, we're just one out there. We bought 170 million pounds of beef trimmings next last year. Mm. We're gonna do the same or, or more this year. We wanna have that supply there and available for us on into the future. And we're depending on the beef producers in the US to, do, to deliver that for us. And one thing we haven't talked about is it doesn't even end at the consumer because food waste is a big part of sustainability and consumers have a role as well. Sarah, what would you say? Yeah, I would just say, you know, affirmatively beef is sustainable, right? And demand for beef is growing and it will continue to grow in the future. And we have an amazing story to tell with the, <clears throat> with the power of ruminant animals, right? And I really think we should come back to that of, that's what makes beef unique yes. uh, from any other protein choice that someone's going to make a choose out there um, and that upcycling story and, and just focusing on you know what's right for the animals right for the producer really does come down to sustainability so it, it, as was said don't be afraid of the word use it as 
a way to convey what you are doing so well already. Bob, from a producer standpoint. Well, I'd like to just, just say to my fellow producers that uh, don't, don't feel threatened by the term sustainability. It, it really speaks to, uh, you know, things that we've done uh, forever and, you know, being good stewards of the land, good stewards of our livestock, stewards, good stewards of our businesses and our communities. Mm -hmm. So uh, just, just don't feel threatened by it. I think the things, the basic components of sustainability program are things that, that are going to be positive for beef producers as well as consumers. And, uh, and you know, the, the more we go down this, this trail, I think the, the better it's going to be and we're going to be able to optimize our, uh, our programs, our, our organizations, our uh, ranches and, and uh, all of our businesses. And so, and I think uh, that, that lends itself to the consumer as well. And so we wanna, we wanna share this, this journey with our consumers mm -hmm. and it, it's gonna be a good one. And you said something early on that resonated with me and that was the term continuous improvement. We really are all about continuous improvement and that's a huge message of the sustainability discussion, right? It is and, and uh, uh, cattle producers have always uh, I mean, if they're going to be successful, they have to be innovative mm -hmm. and they have to be kind of willing to look at uh, new practices and things that are going to make their operation better. And uh, we've always kind of been about that. So sustainability kind of is goes goes hand in hand with with those programs. So. Excellent. Well, this has been a great discussion and I want to thank each of you for coming to the show, but more importantly, for the leadership you're providing for our industry. Thank you all. Now, if you want to keep up to date on this important topic, you can get valuable information on sustainability and how it's impacting the beef cattle industry by simply visiting the website beefresearch.org. We're back with more right after this. The Case IH sales event is going on now, making it a great time to get the equipment you need at a price you can afford. You'll find new Farmall, Maxim, and Puma Series tractors, along with our complete line of hay tools, all at a special rate. But hurry, the sales event ends July 31st. As a stocker operator, your job is to turn forage into profit. With the right implant, you can. Revlor G improves grazing performance for 150 days the same length as the typical grazing period. And it's dosed for stockers' maturity levels, adding up to an extra 23 pounds. See why Revlor G is the number one choice in stocker implants at RevlorG.com. A withdrawal period has not been established in pre-ruminating calves. Do not use in calves to be processed for veal. Colorado Saddlery has been making saddles since the year I was born and I'm still riding one. From rancher to outfitter and in between, if you're looking for a saddle, start here. Our best-selling saddle is a lightweight one for trail riders. Colorado Saddlery is a family business and takes pride in their work. High quality and reasonable prices, best warranty in the country, and American-made. 303-572-8350. Shipping's free on new saddles. ColoradoSaddlery.com. Did you know that Prefert makes over a thousand different farm, ranch, and rodeo items? And now, thanks to Prefert Direct, it's easier than ever before to get access to every item Prefert makes delivered direct to your local dealer. For more information about Prefert Direct, visit us at prefert.com. Prefert, America's number one name in farm, ranch, and rodeo. To get involved with NCBA and learn more about the policies and issues that affect your cattle business, why not become a member? There are great incentives to do so, including a free 2.5 liter bottle of Epra Zero from Norbrook for all new NCBA members. To join, just call 866-233-3872 or visit the website ncba.org. And joining us now for an update on sustainability issues is Dr. Sarah Place. Oh, thanks for having me. Dr. Place, the panelists addressed how both domestic and international consumers viewed sustainability in the beef industry. How do you think this COVID-19 pandemic will impact consumer food choices in the future? 
Yeah, so I think there's been a lot of changes. Um, and first and foremost, I would say, I think a lot of people have gotten back to the basics, right? One, because a lot of people are under economic distress, a lot of folks have lost their jobs, their budgets are a lot tighter. And so they're thinking about how can I feed my family, feed myself, provide quality nutrition. Uh, anecdotally, of course, we've seen a lot of meat cases at the early stages of this pandemic be sold out, right? As people shifted from making food purchases at uh, food service type establishments to retail. And we saw maybe a little bit of panic buying, but also just a big shift in the supply chain. And now as we've seen this bottleneck in the industry with packing plants being affected and reduced processing capacity, we've seen some shortages again. So I think there's a bit of a double-edged sword and it's a bit of speculation, but I would say uh, in times of crisis, people are probably going back to what they know which is what they find comfort in, what they know is a good value, and a lot of that has been meat. But there are, of course, risks associated with it, too, in terms of the public perception and a lot of the news stories that have been out there about meat shortages uh, and their perceptions about the safety of the industry. Given all the economic challenges we're facing and even the reports of shortages in meat cases across the country, do you think animal care and sustainability will still be a top issue for U.S. consumers? Yeah, so I think that that part of the question about animal care, animal welfare, thinking about, you know, are people going to still care about these things? Um, I think yes, right? Um, even though we haven't seen these issues of depopulation or anything in the cattle industry, which I think there's a bit of a misnomer out there about that. Um, I think people have seen images of dumped milk or uh, animals having to be euthanized and have really been concerned, but also from, from a kind of two different points of view, right? One of thinking about we have hunger in this country and we're dumping food, um, but also people being concerned about animal welfare. And I actually, I think, you know, surprisingly, people still care, right? And it's because of that human animal connection that they have and they have that relationship with their pets, it may be. Um, but people care about animal welfare always, right? That's not something that's going to go away. And I think that's something to, to keep in mind is these issues, they're going to rise and fall in importance a bit, but they're always going to be there, right? And part of it is just, it's good business practice, right? Doing the right thing, uh, whether it's for animal welfare, or for animal care, health of animals and uh, the environment, those, those issues are fairly stable in terms of their kind of fundamental. So those are going to probably still be important in the future, even though people are going to be making their decisions based on the hard time situations that they're in as well. There was a discussion about the metrics we need to use to actually measure our progress with sustainability. I'm curious, how do we move forward with science and data at a time when it be very easy for both consumers and producers to react emotionally to this situation? Yeah, so science is always going to be important, right? And I think what, what this uh, pandemic situation has just highlighted is that uh, our metrics have usually focused on things like greenhouse gas emissions per pound of beef produced, which of course can be an important metric, but it can't be the only thing we focus on. Um, this, this pandemic has highlighted you need to focus on resiliency, right? The ability of a system to deal with shocks. Um, and you have to think about sustainability metrics as more than just the environment, right? First and foremost, it has to be clearly stated, right? If, if producers cannot make money and cannot be in business, then the whole system is not sustainable. And I think this is an opportunity and a time to highlight that to consumers is when the, the light is on the supply chain to say, hey, you know, people at the beginning of the supply chain, the people that are raising commodities in this country need to be able to survive economically and financially. Um, and I think that resonates with people because a lot of people are struggling right now. Um, and so that's, that's an opportunity, if you will, to change the conversation and make it deeper and make it more relevant, I think, to the real world and making sure that these metrics they are science-based, but they're also based in the reality that you know, we, have, we have to be able to have economic viability, right? People have to be able to afford food, and we have to be able to have the people in the supply chain make a living, right? That's, that's fundamental to the whole thing. The key thing here is that it's, it's highlighted that agriculture is essential, right? Um, I think to all of us in agriculture, that's kind of a no-brainer statement, but I think it's becoming very clear to people, like when push comes to shove, it's like, do I have shelter? Do I have water? Do I have food? And this, this situation has, has made that clear, right? That agriculture and food production 
is really, really key. Greenhouse gas emissions have always been a driving force in our discussion around sustainability. And I'm curious, as we've seen planes, trains, and automobiles actually grounded the last couple of months, has that given us an opportunity to demonstrate that beef production really isn't the leading cause of greenhouse gases? Yes, so the pandemic situation has really highlighted that, again, agriculture is not a major contributor in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. And we've definitely seen um, images on the Internet of clearer air in major metropolitan areas like places like Los Angeles. Right. So um, burning fossil fuels is a major driver of air pollution in terms of particulates. Uh, and that's where we've seen these, these shots of clear air. Right. So things like. Uh, nitrogen dioxide, which is not a greenhouse gas, but does have impacts on human health and especially respiratory health, which is very relevant at this point in time. Uh, and then specifically on greenhouse gas emissions, you know, if we look at the EPA data, you know, 75, almost 80 percent of the U.S. greenhouse gas emission budget is from burning fossil fuels, right? So that is the elephant in the room when it comes to greenhouse gas emissions uh, animal agriculture is only four and a half, five percent beef specifically about 2% of emissions that come directly from cattle and their manure. So that's what's really key for people. And I think it's highlighting again, eating is essential. It's not optional. We can't eat our way out of climate change, right? It doesn't matter if somebody eats tofu or they eat a ribeye steak every day, right? It, it's not going to make a big difference in the greenhouse gas emission budget. And I think this is an opportunity with the data that we're going to see, again, even though it's a terrible experiment, but it is a way to highlight how fossil fuel combustion is really the driver here. It's not, it's not animal agriculture. It's not beef cattle, right? We have a contribution and we can work to reduce it. And American cattle producers already have. They made tremendous strides in terms of improving efficiency and reducing uh, environmental impacts per unit of beef production. But again, I think that's, that's what's key for folks is just say, you know, we're going to continue on this path of getting better, but we are not the major contributor, right? And I think it's just putting those things in context for people. I hope you've enjoyed our discussion today on beef industry sustainability and found it to be both informative and insightful. And of course, you can watch any of our programs anytime on the Cattleman to Cattleman page on YouTube. Well, that's our time for now. I'm Kevin Oxner, and I'll see you next week right here on RFD TV.